The Old Testament lesson for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost is from the book of Genesis, the 18th chapter. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place. For their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again, he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. And then he said, O let not the Lord be angry. And again, I will speak but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee. The epistle is from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, the second chapter. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them 
in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel this day according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I will have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? But Thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to Thee, O Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear these words of Jesus. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, to the one who knocks, rather, it will be opened. Thus far, our text for this morning how would you feel if I said the following words to you this morning? Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? A few of you perhaps might have gotten a little nervous because that was a question that was asked you in confirmation class and you haven't thought about the answer to that question, what does this mean, in years and years and years. Others of you, perhaps you'll remember that with these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that He is our true Father, and we are His true children, so that with all boldness and confidence we may ask Him as dear children, ask their dear Father. Maybe as I started to give you that word from the small catechism, uh, maybe it started to ring a bell. Maybe it came back to you like it was just yesterday. Or maybe you're still sitting and saying, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Well, either way, today we're talking about prayer. 
Prayer is a beautiful thing. It's the breath of the Christian. We breathe in the word of God that is graciously given to us. We take it in through our senses, through our eyes as we read the Bible, through our ears as we hear preaching and proclamation, as we hear the scriptures themselves read in our presence. God uses those ears and he uses this mind and he uses our very souls as the canvas on which his Holy Ghost paints his beautiful gospel message for us. The breath out of a Christian is prayer. It's how we express our faith. It's how we confess who God is. And it starts with that understanding, with that word, Father. It starts with knowing that God is our true Father and we are his true children. As St. Paul said to the Colossians that we have been given that circumcision made without hands. We have been circumcised into Christ by the waters of baptism. That God has set us apart so that we are the children of God. That was the covenant of circumcision in the Old Testament. That for Abraham and for all of his offspring after him, they, the men, the males, the boys would be circumcised and so they would be named as members of Abraham's family. But now Paul tells us there is a new circumcision. Paul tells us that this baptism is the means by which we are marked, we are placed into the family, into the kingdom of God. So with these words, our Father who art in heaven, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our Father each and every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, each and every time we start a prayer, Dear Father in heaven. And that we are his true children. And what does that mean? Well, that with boldness and confidence, we ask him as dear children ask their dear Father. Now, Being a father myself, I can tell you that sometimes children ask for the strangest of things. They ask for things like, Dad, can we stay up two hours later tonight than usual? They ask for things like, can we take our gaming devices with us every single place that we go for the rest of our lives? They ask us if we can have things like dessert instead of dinner. I know that any parents in the room can't relate, and children, you certainly don't understand what I'm talking about right now. These are the kinds of things that children ask their parents. From a purely objective standpoint, of course it's unreasonable. Of course it's not what's best for you. Of course, no one in their right mind would give you all of the sweets, never make you go to bed, and let you rot your brains on video games. And yet, we are loving parents. That doesn't necessarily mean that we give our kids everything that they want. We give them what they need, but we also are gracious to them. Now, I'll admit I'm the worst at this because I'm too permissive when I shouldn't be and I'm, I'm too harsh when, well, when I should be gracious. Perhaps you feel the same way. Perhaps you look back on years as a parent and you say, there are so many things that I would have done different if I knew then what I know now. Same for me and I'm right in the middle of it. I love the way that our text begins today. You see, Jesus has been off praying by himself. He's been off uh, in a certain place, Luke tells us, and Jesus did this quite frequently. He would go off and, and he would seek a place of solitude, either out in the wilderness or on a mountaintop or just away from the crowds, and he would pray to his Father. When he had finished, he came back, and the disciples, one of them, said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. It's a bold re- request, isn't it? But it's a beautiful request, and it's a request that Jesus honors, that he answers right then and right there. Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gives to them the Lord's Prayer. Now, in my role as a pastor, you would not believe how many times people have come up to me and said, will you teach me how to pray? 
They'll hear me pray at a, at a family reunion down at the picnic grounds or uh, offer the meal prayer after a funeral, and they'll say, how did you learn to pray like that? I usually just kind of, kind of blow off the answer and say something along the lines of, well, you know, I mean, four years of seminary education and a mountain of student debt, that's what it takes. No, that's not what it takes. Sometimes I say, well, practice makes perfect, and that's why I keep on practicing at it. But perhaps I should take those requests a little bit more in earnest. Perhaps when people ask me, or perhaps when people ask you, how do you pray? We should ponder a little bit more the answer that we give to them. Now prayers, they start off simple, don't they? The prayer of a child can be something like, um, you know, God, make sure that it doesn't rain tomorrow so that I can play outside, which around here, it's not a very good prayer. We need the rain. <laughs> Maybe it's something like, you know, God, help me to, uh, help me to get a, a good grade on this test that's coming up, even though I didn't study for it, even though I'm not going to put in the time or the effort or the energy. Maybe it's something like, God, please help me to get along with my friends. Now, those prayers are actually beautiful. Calling out to God in time of need, there's nothing more beautiful, nothing even more biblical than that. You heard the words of our psalm earlier. God says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and then you shall glorify me. That's exactly what God expects of us. Uh, the, the most brief prayer that I think I've ever heard uh, uttered is, Help, Lord. And that prayer is a prayer out of a place of trouble. And God hears those prayers. Father, holy is your name. Your kingdom come among us. Give us each and every day our daily bread. Provide for us. Forgive us our sins. We forgive those who are indebted to us, who we have something to hold above them, and yet we forgive them for the sake of Christ, and then lead us not into temptation. That's the short version of the Lord's Prayer. That's what Jesus gives here in Luke 11. But then Jesus expands. He expounds upon what he has delivered already to the disciples. He says this strange parable of a guy who knocks on the door at midnight... He knocks on the door and he says, can I have three loaves of bread? I got some friends that just came into town and I'd, I'd really like to, to feed them and I don't have anything. I should remind you that in the ancient world, you didn't generally have just bread, you know, on a shelf somewhere. But making bread required actually making the dough and kneading it and allowing it to rise and firing up the oven, which wasn't just turning a knob. And then you had to put the bread in and wait for the bread to, to bake. And then you'd take it out and wait for it to cool. And then you could say, here's your loaves of bread. I'm going back to bed. It's like 4 o'clock in the morning now. He says, no, the guy's going to respond, right? He's going to respond and say, don't bother me. The door's shut. My kids are already in bed. He says, you know, uh, I, what are you doing knocking on the door? Jesus says, no, the guy's going to listen. Now, he's not going to listen because they're such great friends. What kind of a friend comes at midnight? But he's going to listen because he's going to be in that state of, of you know, bewilderment, bewilderment that it even happened. His impudence, the fact that he dared to knock on his door while he's half asleep. Have you ever done this while you're half asleep? And you're just like, yes, let's, let's take care of what needs to be taken care of. He's going to do this. He's going to rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, I don't think that what Jesus is saying here is that when we pray at midnight or whenever, that we're going to catch God half asleep and that God's going to wake up with one eye open and he's going to do whatever we ask, not because we're friends, but because, well, uh, we caught him off guard or something like that, because we dared to ask him. Because Jesus talks this way to say what's next. Ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Because he says, with God, it's not like that guy who might, one time out of a hundred, in his half-asleep state, do whatever you ask of him. But instead, God rejoices to answer your prayer. 
So ask and he'll give it to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock. He's going to open the door. I promise, Jesus says. And then Jesus takes it back to the teaching of a parent. The teaching from a parent to a child. I was thinking about this uh, while I was at the airport a couple of days on my way back. There was um, a family that was sitting right across from me. And, uh, and this was a family of five. Uh, there was a husband, there was a wife, and there were kids that were, the, the smallest was, I think they said two. And I commented very early on my time sitting across for them. I said, can I just compliment you? Your family really knows how to travel. Because the The children were all sitting there pleasantly in the seats. Mom had opened up and she had snack bags for each one of them that they had opened it up and they were, you know, wet wipes to wipe off their hands before they ate. It was really a beautiful thing to see and it was nothing like when we travel because it's, (laughs) it's a circus when we travel. It was a really beautiful thing to see and, and what I realized was that These children are learning from their parents how to conduct themselves. Now, I'm not saying that that we get it all wrong. we're, We're okay at traveling. But there are things that we pass on to our children. You'll, you'll, You'll see it this way. There are even things that we say as parents that our children repeat after us. Little mannerisms, little turns of phrase that not every family says. That you'll hear your kids say and you'll say, that's the thing that I always say. Well, it's the same way with prayer. It's the same way with the words that we speak to our Father in heaven. Jesus says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Well, the obvious answer there is no father in his right mind. When his father asked for the Winchester Volunteer Fire Department's fish fry fish, would say, here's a copperhead instead. Or if he asks for an egg for breakfast, would instead say, look what I found, here's a scorpion. Jesus isn't necessarily saying that that we are evil, although I think that that's true, but he's saying you who are in comparison to God, you are evil, but you know how to give good gifts to your children. So how much more? Well, the heavenly Father, the one who is perfect and blameless, the one who is good and kind and just, How much more will he give? And here is the part where our text actually makes perfect sense. The Holy Spirit. He will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. People often get confused when we talk about prayer. Especially when Jesus says, ask and you will receive it. Well then, Lord, I want to win the lottery. Well then, God, help me to get a raise at work. Well then... Dear Father in heaven, I'd like to drive a nicer car. That's not what Jesus here promises. You see, the thing that we learn over time as Christians is that we pray in the name of Jesus. And to pray in the name of Jesus means to pray according to the will of Jesus, according to his good pleasure. And when we pray according to his good pleasure, we pray for the things that he would have us to pray about such as, Dear Heavenly Father, give us your Holy Spirit. That is a prayer that God answers every single time. That's a prayer that he has promised that he will never, ever withhold from us. And you know, when you boil it all down, that's the only prayer that we ever need to have answered. Because to give us his Holy Spirit is to give us faith. And to give us faith is to give us life eternal. That faith that clings to the cross of Jesus Christ. That faith that finds its hope and its fulfillment in baptism. The promise that we have been crucified. We have been dead and buried with Jesus. And now our lives are hidden away with Christ who is risen from the grave. Who has ascended to the right hand of the Father. Who will come again on the last day to usher in the new heavens and the new earth. Where we will have no needs. No wants. No lack. We will be in the presence of Jesus forever. That's a prayer that I can get behind. That's a prayer that I can pray each and every day. Lord, your will be done in my life. Give me your Holy Spirit. 
that I may believe, that I may trust as I ought, and that I may speak as you would have me to speak. I think prayer is one of those beautiful things that God has given us. It's the words that God gives us to express, to confess, to speak forth our faith when otherwise words fail. When otherwise there's nothing left to say. Because if we're real and we look around the world around us, we see how things are falling apart, how things are broken, how things aren't the way they're supposed to be. Without that prayer for the Holy Spirit, we're hopeless. So God grant us to pray. God grant us to call upon Jesus' Father as our Father. God teach us the words that we are to say so that his will might be done in our lives, so that his Holy Spirit might be poured out upon us, and so that we might receive eternity forever. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it will guard your hearts, it will guard your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he does come again. Amen.